Hello, everybody. It is Wednesday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, Assistant Sports Editor for Multimedia at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, back for yet another Penn State podcast, the last one of the season, at least the regular season, with Seth Engel of the Daily Collegian and the Post-Gazette. Um, Seth, a lot of talk, lot to talk about with regarding the quarterbacks and some of James Franklin's comments about Manny Diaz recruiting. Um, a little more action-packed than I expected this last weekend uh, to be for this team, especially going into the holiday. Yeah, no, it's been uh, it has been pretty busy. Um, you know, I came home a couple of days ago, so I'm back in Chicago, um, which is you know kind of nice because going to Detroit um, later in the week. But trying to manage this um, all remotely is definitely a different experience when there's a little more news than maybe I was anticipating. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna get into all of that. Um, who's gonna play at quarterback? Who should play at quarterback? Um, but before we do, just want to thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast and all season, uh, Voodoo Brewery in State College, just in time for the change in weather. The crew at Voodoo Brewing in State College, located right off College Avenue at 201 Elmwood Street, has launched their new seasonally inspired line of cocktails, including the crowd favorite hot spiked apple cider. And that's not all. The State College Pub's new permanent kitchen is now open. The kitchen is now owned and operated by Voodoo Brewing Company and will feature the elevated pub fare made famous at their other Voodoo locations. They will also continue to offer items like the lobster roll and crab cake sandwich that have become synonymous with the State College Pub. Um, before we get too far into it, Seth, who do you think is going to start a quarterback Friday night? Drew Aller coming off the injury against Rutgers. Uh, Bo Perbula plays most of the second half. Um, does a pretty decent job, but doesn't really throw. What is your read on, on where things stand with Aller? Is he going to be healthy enough on a short week to come back? Um, and 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 make an impact for the Nittany Lions this week. James Franklin said he expects Drew to be back. Um, it looked like an arm injury to me. It kind of looked like maybe a shoulder thing. Um, he tried working it out, maybe tweaking it and um, throwing on the sidelines a little bit um, after he got pulled, um, but it just looked like too much discomfort, so Bo kind of handled the rest, um, and he looked good. You know, I do think Drew probably starts this game as he's expected to, but – I think you should give Bo a chance. Like he looked good on on the ground, and um, I think there are a lot of things that Bo can do that Drew's not really able to do. That opens up uh, maybe your explosive um, offense, which which Penn State's really lacked this year. Um, it says something when Bo's able to step in there, and you know his first rush attempt is a thirty nine yarder. Um, I, they didn't score on the drive, but it, it set them up well. And I think you know if you give him more of a chance, more of those opportunities will come along. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting how quickly they got a spark when he came in compared to Aller. I also think it's interesting that and, and frustrating if you're Penn State because I, I stand there and I watch Drew Aller try to run so often now, and, and that's you know look it's it's nice that he maybe has that weapon is is that he can tuck and run if defenses are are not giving him anything and he can pick up yardage. But the downside is what happened Sunday against or excuse me Saturday against Rutgers. Um, you know, if, if Drew Aller is going to be the starting quarterback here next year, is, is that an element of, of his game that we've seen in the second half of the season that you'd like to see limited to, you know, to the necessary moments and, and not just seeming to be a regular part of the offense? Well, I think that Drew's ability to use his legs um, could actually be, um, you know, a nice little, nice little factor to his game. Um, you know, we didn't see it as much in the first half of the year, and we started to see it more in the second half. I know um, he's lost control of the ball a little bit, um, has to work on that. He's obviously not the quickest guy in the world, uh, but I do think that his size poses a threat for defenses. Um, and I look at the Eagles specifically with Jalen Hurts. I think Drew Aller's, you know, bigger than Hurts is, but, you know, on those, you know, fourth and one or third and one packages, when you just need to kind of push over the line of scrimmage, I think Drew Aller is the ideal build um, for that type of scheme. Um, I also think that, you know, he's able to create um, potentially some, some extra yards on the ground just based on his size. You know, he's built kind of like a tight end. Um, that's what, you know, strength trainer Chuck Losey said last year. Um, he's like a tight end or a defensive end. It's not easy to bring him down. Um, you know, he's probably not going to break off for those 30-plus yard rushes like Bo Prabula. But, you know, he can get you some some work on the ground if he uh, if he just works on his ball security. Yeah, and I think protecting himself is the key. I, I think you bring up a good point with the size, and, and, and you can imagine a world where he, you know, takes a little bit after maybe a Josh Allen as the prototype 
Um, but he, he just looks a little awkward in doing it. And I think it, it kind of felt to me like this injury was coming with, with the punishment that he was taking on those runs. So I think that, you know, to your point, I think there's, there's something to work with there. I think he has to round that out a little bit. Yeah, I agree. No, it's, it's, he was getting slammed a little bit. Um, and this is a guy who hasn't been sacked too much this year, um, considering, you know, how relatively solid the offensive line has been, um, but you know when he escapes the pocket, those are those are the times when you've kind of seen him get uh you know really pulled to the ground and uh, hit hard. You know it's a uh, it's risky for a quarterback. Um, but you know with someone his big, I mean someone his kind of stature, um, I do think that he's able to kind of take those blows more than more than you know a normal quarterback. On the other side, Bo Pribula, we know he can run. Can he throw? We did not see that against Rutgers. We really haven't seen it all season in any kind of um, sustained way. James Franklin brought up in his weekly news conference Monday that, well, Bo Prabula is out there in a lot of four-minute offense situations. And that's true, but it does seem like that that when you get to such a high percentage of runs for him, um, that that's also a little bit unnatural. Would you like if he he gets, let's say, a quarter or maybe even part of, of the third quarter and the fourth quarter this week, at Michigan State, do you want to see him in some passing downs going into this offseason? Maybe make some throws that, that build a little confidence to, you know, I don't know if it's going to set up a quarterback competition going into next offseason, but um, at least put him in a position where if he does come into a game for to use his legs next season, the defenses also have to respect his arm. Well, that's the thing, right, is because James always talks about um, catching defenses off guard and giving them more to game plan for which is the reason why we even saw Bo in the first place um, in the kind of those red zone packages. Um, if he's able to throw the ball, you know, that does, that does a lot. It, it really does a lot. It adds a whole nother component to a defensive game plan where it's not just Drew Aller they have to game plan for. They know that Bo's probably going to play. Um, and if he comes in, they don't know if he's going to run or pass. Um, but we don't know if he's able to pass, you know, Bo, Bo said he's confident. James said he's confident in Bo to, and Bo Bo to throw and same with the other kind of offensive weapons. Um, but we haven't seen it. It's only been eight pass attempts from, from Pribula this year. Um, I would like to see, you know, a little bit of what he can do, especially if, you know, Aller is maybe a little banged up. They want to get him out early um, depending on what the score looks like. But yeah, I, I totally would like to see uh, Bo throw the ball. Does that involve him possibly playing when it's not like a, a two, three, four score game late in the game? Do, do, would you like to see him in kind of what we saw against Rutgers this week where Penn State had some level of game control? I, I don't think that you felt like Penn State was in a ton of Im- imminent danger from Rutgers, but um, the game was close enough that, you know, Rutgers hits a couple of plays, they're back in it, and, and Bo has to win the game. Would you like to see him in, in those, you know, weightier spots um, earlier in the game than, than in a blowout where, you know, you are just kind of trying to run the ball to, to get out of there, you know, with, without a whole lot of injury and, and, and move on. Yeah, it kind of goes back to what we were saying before is that he just brings a spark that I don't think Drew is able to bring. So when you're struggling to create explosive plays, that's a guy that you know is capable of, of breaking out for a 30-plus yard rush. Um, that Drew can't and that, you know, the running backs haven't been able to do consistently either. Um, and, you know, in the past game, it hasn't really worked as well. Um, and, you know, so many of these three and outs um, have been, you know, pretty frustrating for this team um, that kind of just wants something to break open a drive and create momentum. And I think Bo, you know, in, in you know, limited fashion has shown that he is capable of doing that. Um, but, you know, my question is just, if defenses know he's going to run, how is that going to work long term? I agree. Uh, much more quarterback talk to come here between now and the bowl game. Seth, I want to get into the NFL guys because, uh, or at least the possible NFL prospects on this team. Uh, I think you tweeted yesterday that Tyler Warren and Chop Robinson were both non-committal about whether they'll be back at Penn State last or next season. I think I saw a comment. I think Johnny McGonigal, our former Penn or P- former Pitt beat writer here at the Post Gazette, tweeted that uh, Chop Robinson wanted a picture with his sign at Beaver Stadium the other day because it, it might and very probably might be his last game. What is your read on on who's who's staying and who's coming back among those underclassmen as we go into this last 
um, you know, into this last weekend with with bold decisions looming about whether those guys are going to play in whatever bowl game Penn State makes it to or not. Yeah, I mean, it, when it gets to this point where there's one more game of the regular season, you know, it's it's about the time when you start asking the question, you know, have you thought about it at all? And most, if not every time that they're asked, these players are going to say they're not, they haven't thought about it, which, you know, probably isn't true, um, that they don't have a decision yet. Um, so, you know, when it comes to Tyler Warren and Chop Robinson, uh, they were, I mean, obviously they didn't, you know, address their decision at all, but um, a decision will come sooner rather than later. Um, and I think especially too with them potentially going to a bowl game that isn't, I mean, I know it's probably going to be a New Year's Six, but the fact that it's not a playoff game um, or, you know, a game as prestigious as the Rose Bowl, I think that kind of might uh, mean that there are more opt-outs than maybe we saw last year. Um, but I do think that, you know, right off the bat, the two guys that I think are, you know, definitely going to declare for the draft are uh, Chop Robinson and, and Olu Fashionu. Is there anyone else that you're intrigued about um, that you think is, is on that borderline that you're, you're curious to see what decision they make? Yeah, I think Kalen King is probably going to declare as well. Um, the interesting thing with him is that this was a guy that was almost a surefire uh, first round pick at the beginning of the year. Um, and since then has kind of, you know, dipped um, when it came to, you know, facing off with, with Marvin Harrison Jr. He struggled um, and, then when it got to later in the season and he was getting more targets than he was in the first half of the year, like he, he just didn't look as good as he did last year. Um, and, and last year could have been a product of the fact that Joey Porter jr. Was getting all the targets um, or, or that Joey Porter jr. Wasn't getting the targets. So Kalen King was kind of matching up with these number two wide receivers and, and really dominating them, which still says something about his game. Um, but if he wants to be, you know, a true star like scouts maybe thought he was going to be at the beginning of the, at the beginning of the year, um, there might be a little more that he has to show. Do you think NIL can play a role in in, in marginal guys like that? I, I shouldn't say marginal. I think Kalen King is going to be drafted and probably drafted in a pretty decent spot, make a decent amount of money. Um, <clears throat> but if you're not in that first round, I, I think it becomes a, a harder decision. Do you get do you get the sense that 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 could make a difference? Because I've been watching a lot of college basketball early in the season here, and I've been very proud of how many players I know from last season. Because a lot of guys have started to kind of stick around in, in that sport. Do you think the math is is going to start to change for those maybe projected second, third, fourth, fifth round guys, where maybe staying another year in college could benefit them and and not cost them in the way it did when when there was no NIL in play? It could. It definitely could. Um... Because these guys are probably making a lot of money. If you're a, a star player at your college, um, you know, you could make maybe upwards of a million dollars sometimes. Um, and and if you're a low round pick, um, like I know there are every year there are these quarterbacks that are kind of stars in, in college, right, at their respective schools. And they're always projected pretty low. Like scouts just don't see them having an NFL future. For guys like that who are, you know, mid to low level of the pack, um, I think that maybe an extra year, if they have it, you know, could be good, um, just based on the NIL opportunities. And, um, but, but when it comes down to it, I, I think if your stock is high enough for you to potentially carve out a multi-year deal, um, and carve out a future in the NFL, I think you, I mean, you have to kind of, you have to take that. Um, you don't want to risk it with going back to school, getting injured. It's all the same things that we had talked about before NIL. Um, with whether you want to declare or return, it's just there's maybe this other component. Um, if really there isn't too much of an NFL future with you, even without an injury. Yeah, I'll be interested to see what, what decisions people make. Um, another big topic of discussion is, as we brace for the off season here, Seth, or, or at least you know the beginning of what I like to call the soft off season. That month between the regular season and the bowl game um, is when things start to happen, even though there is a game remaining on the schedule. Uh, Manny Diaz's future has come up in a, in a lot of places as defensive coordinator. Um, I know James Franklin spoke about it. His, his, his news conference basically said it's, it's similar to Brent Pry. Um, you know, Manny Diaz is going to wait for a, a plum job to come calling and, and not just go anywhere to take a job just to move up from from defensive coordinator to head coach, but a place where he feels like he can he can thrive. Do you see that opening on the horizon for him this offseason? 
there are so many head coaching jobs out there right now. Like this is the off season that it seems like every program um, is kind of, you know, cleaning house. Um, there's a, a lot of changes coming to college football next year um, and a lot of struggling powerhouses who need someone new um, and someone to find. And I think Manny Diaz is just a guy who's really attractive um, for, for one of those positions where, you know, he's, he's been a head coach at the power five level um, and he's, you know, also been a pretty successful, very successful defensive coordinator um, at a powerhouse school. Um, I think that those two things um, kind of combined for a perfect resume um, when looking for for a new head coach and giving him another chance. I just don't think that, you know, Miami was the place for him to, to thrive. But I think that if he's given a good opportunity that makes sense for him, I think I think there's a lot uh, that Manny Diaz could do as a head coach. And I would, you know, I would be surprised if he returns for another year just because of how much he's proven himself. You know, he's done so much the past two years. Um, he's taken what Brett Pry built and taken it to another level, really. Um, and, and Penn State's defense has been, you know, one of, if not the best defense in the country this year. Are there any are there any net openings on the board that intrigue you for him? Um, you know, Texas A&M is going to probably get whoever they want. They got the deep pockets. Syracuse comes on the market this week, uh, firing, firing Dino Babers. Um, is, is there a job that that you look at and say that that could be the fit that if I was Manny Diaz, I'd really like? Not yet. I mean, there really isn't. I, I see there are some rumors with Mississippi State. Um, that didn't make sense at all. Uh, that's a that's a really hard school to coach. Like it's got to be a lot easier than it was at Miami um, for him to find success there. Um, because that's a hard school to come into, like I said before. Uh, Mississippi State's really hard. Um, but there's so many kind of changes on the horizon right now. Like it seems like they're a new kind of bulk of firings um, every week now, probably starting two weeks ago. Um, so something's going to pop up that, that you go, oh, okay, well, that makes sense for Manny Diaz. And he's going to be like the number one candidate for that. Um, but then, you know, with more firings, that means that Penn State has more of a pool to – you know, replace him as well, um, and then to replace, you know, their offensive coordinator. Um, but if Manny Diaz does leave, you know, this is a very, very interesting offseason for Penn State, um, having to potentially replace, you know, both coordinators, um, which is something I can't remember the last time um, in an offseason that they had to, you know, replace both of those guys. Yeah, I think that'll be an intriguing storyline to watch. Seth, um, we're getting into also some other topics that came up in the news conference. Um, specifically, James Franklin talked about the flap of, of a recent – I don't remember his name, but he's a quarterback commit for the 2025 class who basically said he knew Mike Yersich was getting fired before the Michigan game, which people took, took on social media as, what the heck? Well, then why was Mike Yersich calling plays against Michigan – James Franklin basically says that's not true. Um, what's your read on on that whole flap, and, and does it does it mean anything? Yeah, it's weird. It's definitely weird because um, this is a kid that told two outlets um, that you know James had informed him of of Mike's firing before it happened. Um, it was it was the Athletic and Penn Live, and basically um, he came for the Michigan game and. Um, and he went to a room and he saw James Franklin in there and he saw Danny O'Brien in there and Mike Yersich was nowhere to be seen, which is odd um, considering, you know, he was at the time the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach. You know, this was like his primary recruiter was not in the room. Um, so very odd. Um, James, obviously, like you said, debunked it, um, said this isn't true. Um, I can understand how, you know, maybe a young kid could read that and read the signs. Um, but James basically said he would never do that. Um, but I don't know. You know, I think maybe a decision uh, more or less was 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 maybe made. Um, and it could have been after Ohio State. Um, and they're kind of just waiting it out. I think that, you know, this was my read on it. This is this is highly opinionated, but um, it's possible that after Ohio State, they may have you know, maybe plan to cut ties at the end of the season um, as they've done in the past. Um, but then once, you know, kind of stuck them around for Michigan because um, they didn't want to change up their whole playbook. 
Um, but once they lost there, it was like, all right, this is the end of the road. Two losses, not going to the playoffs. Why don't we start fresh and and uh, you know get a head start in the hiring process, which is smart to me. But um, it's interesting. I, I don't know. That's that's what I think the plan probably was. Um, but I obviously I can't speak to that fully. Yeah, and I, I think you know if if that was the case, then then people have a right to be furious that you had a guy. Not only did you have a guy calling plays against Michigan that you didn't intend to keep around, but you had a guy calling plays against Michigan that you openly said after the Michigan game wasn't on the same page with you. And a game of that magnitude, you can't have that. I mean, that's that's unacceptable. Um, you know, management, especially from a guy in, in James Franklin who fancies himself, and many people consider him a, a kind of CEO coach. Those are the things that you don't get wrong if you're a CEO type of, of the guy who, who knows how to manage. Um, so we may never know, but but I, I certainly understand why people were upset about that. Um, also in James Franklin's news conference, Seth, on uh, Monday, he talked about how he thinks Nicholas, Nicholas Singleton has, has improved this season, is, is better now than he was a year ago, um, even though the stats really haven't been there where do you come down on that? I, I look at Nicholas Singleton and I say, I've seen holes this season that he did not get through with the same intensity that he did last season. I don't, I don't think he's better. I don't think he's dramatically worse. Maybe there are parts of his game that are a little bit more well-rounded than they were a year ago, but you know, he, he was a home run threat last season. I think there has been, op- there have been opportunities to be a home run, run threat this season, even in the context of this offense. And, and he didn't capitalize on that. And I think that's, you know, if, you, if you're giving a grade to a season, I'd, I'd give him a C. Yeah. Well, he, he said, and Franklin said, you can't look at the rushes and you can't look at the stats and, and look at the whole story. Like, it's not going to tell you everything. And I just went, well, how can you not? I mean, this is a running back who was, you know, consistently breaking off for 50-plus rushes as a true freshman last year. And he hasn't done that at all. Um, so no, he has not improved. Uh, maybe he got better as a blocker. Great. Um, blocking as a running back, isn't going to get you the explosive rush that you need to beat Ohio state, Michigan. Um, there were holes. Like you said, if you really look back at the all 22, if you look at the tape, um, I mean, there, there are clear holes. This is an offensive line with the best offensive lineman in maybe program history. Um, and, and he had created holes on that left side. Um, Katron Allen has been the better back. He hasn't been outstanding either, but he's been he's been the better back. Um, I just don't I don't think that Nick Singleton has really improved at all. Um, maybe for NFL scouts, we're looking for a a blocking running back. Like, is that your guy? Maybe, um, but I don't think anyone was looking at Nick Singleton as a fullback. They were looking at him as an explosive running back who could more or less kind of run your offense, and that has just not been the case this year. Yeah, and, and look, I, I think if, if we're talking about the NFL level, um, maybe I could see some merit to, to what James Franklin's talking about. At the college level, you, if you're the type of athlete that we thought Nick Singleton was, you dominate a lot of, of the teams Penn State played this season. Um, and and you, do, you do look explosive. You do not average like plodding around the four yards per carry mark. I mean, that's – that's maybe a good NFL running back. It's not a good college running back, and and so um, yeah, I I, t- I I don't know why he, he he kind of went out on that limb. Um, maybe he frustrating season for him, and and do what he's t- talked about a couple of times is not creating division in the locker room through his public comments. So I mean, if if that's if that's what he's got to do to keep everyone happy, more power to him. I just I don't think the explanation made a ton of sense. To the point that if I was Nick Singleton, I'd kind of be like, eh, I don't know if you really stuck up for me. We wouldn't be having this conversation if James Franklin didn't give that explanation. And I think that's kind of the problem, don't you? Yeah, it's – I mean, the fumbles have been a problem too. You know, it's not just – because he's saying you can't just look at the rushes. I'm like, you really can't because the rushes have been – It's you're a running back. That is your primary job. Your primary job is not to be an offensive lineman. Um, It was really head-scratching to me and – um, he's not holding on to the ball well. I think he has three fumbles now in the year. Um, it, everything has really has regressed, in my opinion. Maybe not as a blocker. Uh, maybe there's some other little tweaks to his game that have been impressive, um, but nothing that stands out as much as a 70-yard touchdown rush. 
Seth, I want to talk a little bit about the, the possibilities with the bowl game. Um, Penn State is in position for New Year's Six Bowl as of now at number 11. Um, they're they're right, right on the edge, so I think they're going to be rooting for some chaos this weekend. Um, well, the right kind of chaos, the teams that, around them that they want to lose. I don't think you want Oregon State to win, for example, um, against Oregon because I think that might vault them back over Penn State, and, and I think Oregon would stay ahead of Penn State, so then Penn State might drop down to 12. But you know what I'm talking about. Barring like bad things, I think Penn State's going to a New Year's Six game. Do you see any realistic possibility beyond the Peach Bowl right now? Um, ESPN's been saying the Fiesta Bowl. They had both of their guys projecting this week. Fiesta Bowl against Oregon. Fiesta Bowl against Washington. I read that and said, no way. I mean, those are two teams that are going to be conference teams next year. Uh, Washington, they played in that game in, in 2017. You're going to tell me we're going to have a rematch at the same bowl game six years later? I mean, usually the playoff committee avoids that. That's why sometimes I wonder if these guys are a little bit lazy in, in picking some of these games um, because I looked at that and said, no, you're not going to re- – and Penn State and Washington play next season too. It's, it's like it didn't make sense to me. And then you look at the Orange Bowl. I don't think Penn State's going to be in position to get that because um, that, that bowl is a little weird. It's the highest ranked non-playoff, non-Sugar Bowl, SEC, or Big Ten team. I think um, Alabama is, is is in that spot right now, so I don't think Penn State's really in the mix for the Orange Bowl. And they were in the Cotton Bowl four years ago. Does it, did all signs kind of point to the Peach Bowl here? Yeah, Peach Bowl makes the most sense. Um, I think the opponent's really the question. And I've seen a lot of different – uh, maybe outcomes of this, you know, I've seen Ole Miss pop up. I've even seen some Alabama, um, but then I've also seen Tulane, which uh, you mentioned the Cotton Bowl, like that matchup, if it's Penn State and Tulane, like that is Penn State Memphis again, um, which sucked, you know, more or less. It, it was, I think viewership was, was at an all time low. Um, no one really cared. Um, I think that one of the benefits of a New Year's Six Bowl is if you're able to win, um, that really does boost confidence for the next year. Like winning the Rose Bowl obviously boosted some momentum. I don't think that winning a Peach Bowl over Tulane does the same thing. Um, not even close. Um, so to me, I mean, I'm I'm if I'm Penn State, win or lose, you know, I I'd want you know a good program. I'd want an Ole Miss. I'd want an Alabama. Um, and, but I, it it does look like the Peach Bowl um, as the most likely landing spot at this time. If you're a Penn State fan and, and Tulane in the Peach Bowl is the, the only New Year's Six path available to you, are you maybe going into this weekend rooting for some chaos to maybe drop you down, quote-unquote, to the Citrus Bowl where maybe you draw a higher-ranked team, um, you know, maybe a, a, I don't know, Ole Miss, a Mizzou type of situation? Um, w- would you rather be in the Citrus Bowl even though it doesn't have quite the cachet of the New Year's Six? No, I think you'd still want to be in a New Year's Six. Um, it just kind of sucks the way it plays out where it might have to be Tulane, uh, where it might have to be, you know, a group of five like that. Um, but I think that the New Year's Six pedigree is still important, especially for Franklin's resume, um, where he's able to pull that out and just be like, hey, I've been this consistent for this long, um, which, you know, is impressive. You know, he hasn't done everything. Uh, he hasn't gone to the playoff. Um, there's a lot. He hasn't. He really hasn't done. He's beaten Ohio State one time. Um but I think that making a New Year's Six still shows that you are, you know, at the top of the greats in college football. Like Penn State, um, you don't want to drop further. You want to be where you've kind of been, um, if not above that. Um, and, and, and that ship has sailed to kind of join the elite threshold. But, um, you know, you want to stay as much as you can um, above the greats of college football before, you know, this, this uh, very unique year in 2024. Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, you do prefer to go to a New Year's Six. I think, um, you know, the Peach Bowl is a place Penn State's never been, so I think you'd, you'd get some um, interest there from the fan base. But then again, I always misread what people usually want because Penn State fans almost always just love to go to Florida. Um, I think they didn't go to that – they didn't go to that Cotton Bowl against Memphis, and then a year later they were in, like, the Outback Bowl, and it was right. packed because Penn State fans love the beach. Um, so we'll see how that shakes out. Seth, before I get let you go, uh, are you sad to see this Michigan State season-ending, bizarro, kind of ironic rivalry going away with, like, I feel like the Land Grant Trophy has kind of become, like, you know, one of those weird, quirky college football things that people love. 
Um, I don't think it's a real rivalry, but but there was still something a little bit more to this game to end the season with. Um, I, for one, I'm, I'm kind of sad to see it go um, just because I, I felt like it was a great way to end, end the season for Penn State. Yeah, always weird, always very weird. Uh, more fun when Michigan State was actually competitive. Um, you know, those of years have kind of dipped away. But, you know, that trophy is is very – it's really interesting. Uh, to see it up close, it's way bigger than I think – um, you'd realize, um, and the players love it. You know, there's always a big party kind of centered around it um, for whoever wins. Um, I know Penn State's claimed it the past couple of years, um, but you know, it, this is uh, it, it's a it's a fun game. Um, it's a weird game. It's going to be at Detroit's uh, Ford Field where the Lions play, so I'm looking forward to that. You know, it should be at a at a neutral site. It should be a pretty a pretty fun matchup um, on Black Friday, which kind of makes it even weirder. Um, I'm not sure how many Penn State fans are going to want to get out of bed after after Thanksgiving and, and drive to Detroit. But, um, you know, there's a there's a relatively big fan base around here in Chicago who you know might make the trip. Um, so we're going to do that in the morning and um, I'll see the land grant trophy at night. Yeah, should be an interesting game. So, Seth, enjoy enjoy this your last regular season game of, of your college career. Congratulations on. Uh, get another season, and we will talk to you during bowl season here, um, you know, coming up to the the actual end of the 2023 campaign for this team. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you again next week. Thank you for checking out this content from Post-Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post-Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com. <laughs>